All right, so let's get going on uh, today's class. So we're still catching up on our uh, on our syllabus. We're uh, starting our look at knowledge today, and uh, because of that, we're going to push back, hand it back, uh, exam two for uh, viewing one more time just to see if we can uh, wrap up uh, our current um, topic in knowledge. So uh, we'll do that next class. Uh, hand back the exam so you can take a look. But uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to continue on with our look at uh, semantic networks. We introduced Collins and Killian's hierarchical model last time, so we're going to do a brief recap of that and then see if there's any evidence that your uh, mind actually organizes knowledge in that way. We're going to take a look at a, a modification of that model, which was Collins and Loftus's spreading activation model, and then that's going to lead into our COG lab on lexical decisions. And then we're going to take a look at some very important implications of that COG lab that go beyond whether or not you can name a word quicker or not, that goes into basically ideas about uh, biases that we have in our society. All right, so the hierarchical model, if you recall from last class, this is a model about how information in our mind is organized. So the idea is that we have different hierarchies that have information organized in terms of nodes, such as this node for canary, and attached to that are features or properties, properties that we know about canaries, that we've stored about canaries. And then the hierarchies are the different categories uh, and subcategories within which these uh, ideas or concepts belong. So canary belongs to bird, bird belongs to animal, shark belongs to fish, fish uh, also belongs to animal. So this is the hierarchical model because of the use of these different hierarchies. And as we saw, they made a few assumptions to uh, um, kind of model or predict how our knowledge can be accessed. So assumption number one is that retrieving any property takes time and also traversing the hierarchy takes time. So moving around and accessing the information in this model, that takes a measurable amount of time. You can't just do it instantaneously. Assumption number two is that these times are actually additive. So as you move through the model, it's almost as if you're moving through a physical space. So if you have to go from the idea of canary all the way up to the idea of animal, that's going to take you twice as long as it would to just go up one level to the idea of bird. So it's almost as if your mind is walking around this network, and the time it takes you to get from one location to another is additive, the same way it would be additive if you have to do multiple stops along the route. Assumption number three uh, was that the time to retrieve a property is independent of the level that you're on. So what that means is that we're just as fast at retrieving ideas or properties about animals, which is a superset, as we are retrieving properties about canaries, which is a subset. So if you're retrieving a property, it doesn't matter if it's in the top level, bottom level, once you're at that level, retrieving a property takes the same amount of time as it would any other level. And uh, those are their three assumptions. So then they ask, what would happen if your knowledge was actually organized this way? If this was the way that your mind stored your knowledge, well, then you would find different reaction times to verify different sentences. And those reaction times would completely depend upon how long it took you to traverse this semantic network, how many hierarchies you would have to go through in order to answer that particular uh, question or to access that propositional knowledge. So they set up a study and what they did was they came up with different types of sentences. So there were superset sentences and these superset sentences could either be a zero level, a one level or a two level sentence. So a zero level sentence would be something like a canary is a canary. So how fast can you say that's true? A canary is a canary. Let me check. Yes, it is. That's true. Well, this is a level zero superset sentence because to verify that a canary is a canary, you have to travel across zero levels of the hierarchy. You just stay at the level that you're at. A level one sentence, a uh, super sentence, would be a canary is a bird. Now you actually have to travel through your hierarchy and you have to travel one level up. So now when you access the idea or the note of canary, 
You can't answer or verify this sentence without going up to Bird and saying, oh, yes, canary is part of that category. It is a subset of that category. Yes, a canary is a bird. And then the final superset or type of superset sentence is, was a canary is an animal. So now we have to travel twice as far. We got to start at canary, go up to bird, and then from bird, we go up to animal. So those types of sentences, the ones where you got to traverse two hierarchies, should take the longest if our knowledge is organized in this particular hierarchical structure. All right, so those are superset sentences. These are sentences where you can answer it by just going up and down the hierarchy, but you don't have to access any features. You don't have to access any properties. They also included property sentences where you would have to access properties to answer this question. So an example would be a canary is yellow. So for this one, you don't have to traverse any hierarchy. You can stay at the hierarchy you're at, but you definitely do have to access a feature. Namely, you got to check is yellow. Is that part of the feature for canaries? So that would be a property zero level sentence because you have to traverse zero hierarchies. A one level property sentence would be something like, does a canary have feathers? So in this case, you can't stay at canary because you do not have the feature has feathers attached to that note. You have to go up a level to bird and then check if birds have feathers. Yes, they do. So then you would be able to verify that sentence and it would take you longer because you have to traverse that hierarchy. And then finally, a canary has skin. Somebody asked you, does a canary have skin? Has skin is not down here in this feature list. You go up a level, has skin is not here in this feature list. You go up a level, has skin is in the animal feature list. And then you would say, all right, that's a property of animals. Yes, a canary does have skin. So that was the situation that they put subjects in. They had a variety of different uh, types of sentences. So they had true sentences, they have false sentences. We're gonna focus on the true ones because the, the data is a little cleaner for those. But again, you know, baseball has innings, baseball, uh, badminton has rules, chess is chess. These are all examples of uh, uh, statements that in order to verify, you would either have to travel zero, one, or two levels in your hierarchy and then the property ones, you actually have to access a property to address that uh, statement. All right, so that's the situation. Now let's see what uh, they actually found. So this is going back to 1969. And uh, here's their data from 1969. So we're gonna zoom in on that a little bit. And we're gonna start off with, uh, which one are we starting off? We're starting off with the property sentences. So first off here on the y-axis, we got mean reaction time in millisecond. So the higher the level, the longer it took people to verify this sentence. The longer they have to think about it before they said, yes, that sentence is true. Here on the x-axis, we have the levels of the sentences. So was it a level zero? Was it a level one? Or was it a level two sentence? And uh, for the results for a uh, superset sentence, <coughs> whoops, for a property sentence, uh, for a canary can sing, it took them about 1.3 seconds to verify can a canary sing. So to say true, took you about 1.3 seconds. Importantly though, to say that a canary can fly took longer, right? So to say that a canary can fly, you had to go up another hierarchy level in order to access that property. So a canary can fly actually took longer and finally, a canary has skin where you have to go up two levels to the level of animal. You have to start a canary, go up to bird, go up to animal. That one took the longest. So this pattern of results here is exactly what you would expect if our knowledge was actually organized in that hierarchical manner. So it takes you longer to answer questions the further up the hierarchy or the further along the hierarchy you have to travel. And then these were the property sentences. These were the superset sentences. And down here you can see a canary is a canary. Very quick, that only took a second to verify. So that's basically the time that it takes you to press the button and stop the timer. So a canary is a canary. And then if we go up to a canary is a bird where you don't have to access any properties, but you have to go up that uh, next level. 
That took longer. That was a higher reaction time. And then finally, a canary is an animal took even longer. So you can see that as you went up the um, as you went up the hierarchies, your speed in verifying those sentences took longer and longer and longer. And this pattern of results is exactly what you would expect if our knowledge was organized in this particular way. All right, any questions about this data and what they found? All right. So it takes you about 75 milliseconds to travel up a level. That's what they found. So if you go up and then up again, those differences are about 75 milliseconds. So we can actually measure how fast our minds can go across those hierarchies. But uh, one question, so, uh, whoops, one question that I want to ask, um, how long does it take you to access a property? And this is, you got the clues right there. So how long does it actually take your mind to access a property? It takes you about 75 seconds to travel from one level to another, from one level to another. But when you're at that level and you have to access one of those properties, how long does it take you to access a property? Where can you see that on this graph? Uh -huh. Right, so these are the milliseconds right here. So what, what, how, what two things can you look at? What difference tells you how long it takes you to access property? Yep. How many levels they had to travel? Um, no, the, the number of levels they had to travel would tell you how long it takes them to traverse a level. But what's the difference? between a canary can sing and a canary is a canary. What's the extra thing you have to do for a canary can sing? You gotta think about the details. You gotta access that property. So both of these sentences, you don't have to traverse a hierarchy. You're sitting there at canary. For a canary is a canary, you're sitting there at the node. For a canary can sing, you're accessing, you're sitting there at the node, but you're accessing the property. So this difference right there, that's how long it takes you to access a property. And it actually takes you longer to access a property than it does to go up another level, which is kind of weird, but that's the way your mind works. So again, these differences here between a canary is an animal, where you just have to go up, sorry, a canary is a bird, where you just have to go up one hierarchy versus a canary can fly, where you got to go up a hierarchy and then access the property, that tells you how long it takes your mind to actually access properties when you're at that particular node. And as you can see, it's basically the same amount of time regardless of the level that you're at. So it doesn't matter if you're accessing properties about animals or accessing properties about fit, um, fish or accessing properties about sharks, it takes you the same amount of time to access that particular property once you're there, once you've traversed those different levels. All right, so it's about 75 milliseconds to travel up a level. It's about 225 milliseconds to actually retrieve a property. And this is extremely clean data for um, these types of uh, uh, cognitive psychology experiments. Uh, you can see, especially on this top one here, this is like a straight line. This is literally like miles per hour and how long is it going to take you to get from one destination to another. So it's incredibly, incredibly clean data. Any questions about anything we've seen so far? All right. It would be great if this was the end of it. It would be great if this model worked, but it actually uh, has its problems, which is why it was eventually abandoned. So problems with the uh, Collins and Killian model is that it couldn't account for uh, the typicality effect. So the typicality effect is that you are faster for uh, typical members of your group than you are for atypical members of a group. So you are faster at answering things about canaries than you are at answering things about ostriches. Because a canary is like a typical bird, but an ostrich is a weird bird, right? You would be faster for canaries than you would be for, uh, for penguins, right? And that is not predicted by the model. Because ostrich is sitting right there, canary sitting right there, same level to traverse, same access of properties. 
they should have the same reaction times. Turns out they don't, not predicted by the model. Other problems are that structures are not perfectly hierarchical. So sometimes you would have a subcategory, for example, of bird, and instead of it having evidence that it goes up to bird, it might be linked straight to animal, right? So it might just bypass one of the hierarchies. And as they collected more and more data, and as they collected more and more uh, information, they just found that it was getting impossible to fit that all into this nice little hierarchical model. So much like what we always find, there's a way that we would like our minds to work. Like this is a really neat, clean, kind of organized way for our minds to be. And as it turns out, our minds have other ideas. Uh, so it turns out that these problems just could not be um, addressed in this hierarchical model. So the uh, Collins um, gave up on it and uh, started working with Loftus. I'd love to know the, the story there. Killian's was, was uh, uh, cast off and Loftus came in. But anyways, Collins and Loftus continued this work on uh, representing our knowledge. And they came up with what is called the spreading activation model. And this one was more powerful and actually uh, could account for the typicality effect. And as we're gonna see, doesn't have any hierarchies. So the spreading activation model gave up the idea of hierarchies in order to try to more accurately represent how our knowledge is structured in our mind. All right, so the spreading activation model, it was a revision of that hierarchical model. New features that it included, first off, not strictly hierarchical. So as I said, the idea of levels in a hierarchy, those are gone. Uh, it doesn't have that strict structure. And uh, in this case, the links between concepts are allowed to have different travel times. So you can have links that are very strong and take a little bit of time to traverse. You can have links that still exist, but are much weaker and they take longer to traverse. So that idea of moving from one level to another level is the same regardless of uh, the level you're at. And that idea of accessing a feature is the same regardless of what concept you're at. That was all thrown out. Now the links between concepts, they can have different travel times. And importantly, and this was one of the big contributions, and we're going to see how important this is, activation of a particular idea can actually spread from the category and exemplar nodes. So when you think of something in your uh, store of knowledge, that node gets activated, and that activation actually spreads out across your knowledge network and starts affecting things that you, not, you weren't necessarily thinking about. So let's take a look at a representation of this. So here we have the idea of red, right? So if you know what red is, if you know what red looks like, you have this concept node somewhere in your mind. So we have red there, and red is going to be associated with fire engines because when you see a fire engine, you see red. And the way that these activation links uh, get, uh, the way that they occur is through association. So you see fire engine, you see red. You see fire engine, you see red. You see fire engine, you see red. Eventually your mind is gonna say, I'm gonna link those two, because they go together. So if I'm thinking about red, I might as well get ready to think about fire engine. So fire engines are, are related to the idea of vehicles, because fire engines are vehicles, they're related to the idea of truck, because they fall under the category of truck. They're also related to ambulances, because they occur together. They're both under the same category of emergency, uh, emergency vehicles. So again, these associations occur, or these connections occur by association, by categorization, by uh, basically your experience with the world, things that go together. And it actually gets very complicated uh, so our minds, no surprise, they're incredibly complicated. So the idea of truck is uh, linked to car, truck is linked to bus, even though a truck is not a bus, they're both large, they both have, uh, they're both vehicles. Uh, they're linked to vehicle, vehicle is linked to street, because that's usually where you find vehicles. And so on and so forth, you'll get links between those forming. And you can see that our nice hierarchical model is gone. <laughs> But uh, again, if that's not the way that your mind represents knowledge, we're trying to get to the actual truth of the matter. All right, so there we have, actually wait, there we have 
there we have our completed model. Yeah, there we have our completed model. And uh, you can see that there's going to be links and interlinks and uh, lots of connections between different concepts. But some of them are not going to be connected. So, for example, uh, rows is not going to be connected to bus because those two typically don't occur together. So your mind's not going to connect those two concepts. The things that do go together, uh, like sunsets and sunrises, uh, the idea of a cloud in the sky with the sun, those things go together. So you'll start forming links between those concepts. So this revision of the hierarchical format, you can see the hierarchy is gone. And they tested this with what was called association priming. And association priming is the idea that your response times, according to this model, are going to be faster if your second item is associated or linked in your uh, hierarchical, sorry, in your spreading activation knowledge network. If two items are linked, thinking about one is going to make you faster to, res sorry, to respond to the other. So response times are faster if a second item of a pair of items is associated with the first. So why would this be? Well, let's say that I tell you red. I say the word red. As soon as you hear it, as soon as you know it, as soon as you're consciously thinking about red, what that means is that your spreading activation model has activated this node. So the first thing to realize is that you're not thinking about everything that you know all the time, right? Most of the nodes that you have in your knowledge set are dormant. They're at a baseline level. They're not activated. As soon as I say something like red, all of a sudden, your mind says, oh, I got that node. Let me activate it. We're thinking about red. We're talking about red. Let me activate red. Now, according to the spreading activation model, once you activate red so that you're consciously thinking about it, that activation starts spreading to anything that is associated with red. So what that means is that all of these other nodes, they get activated to a lesser degree. So you're not going to be consciously aware of it but they are kind of subprime activated. They're ready to go. They're like halfway there. So your mind is incredibly prepared to think about fire engines. Your mind is incredibly prepared to think about orange. Your mind is incredibly prepared to think about cherries as soon as somebody said red. What your mind is not prepared for is the idea of street. So in this case, you are super ready to recognize and understand the idea of fire engine you are still at that zero level of activation to recognize anything about streets. And then that activation continues to spread. Like when you drop a stone into a, into a lake and you see those ripples go out, they get weaker and weaker the further they go, but it continues to spread and to activate nodes at like lower and lower levels throughout your network. All right, so that's a spreading activation model. And importantly, if our mind was organized in this way, if this is actually the way that our mind organized information, what that would mean is that if I say something like red and fire engine, you would be extremely quick at recognizing fire engine. You would be extremely quick at saying, oh yeah, I know what that is. If I said red first, because these two are related. So red gets activated and then through spreading activation, fire engine is already halfway there. So when I say fire engine, you just got to activate it a little bit more in order for fire engine to become consciously aware. A pair that should take longer would be something like red cloud. Because even though cloud did get activated, because red activated sunset, sunset activated cloud, it got less activated because it's further away from the concept of red. So it's going to take a little bit more time now for your mind to drag it up to conscious levels of activation. What should take the longest is something like red street. Because by this time, going all the way over here, the spreading activation has died out, right? Like ripples on a pond if you go far enough away. And street is still at those zero levels. So because of that, if I say red, you're like, oh yeah, red's activated. And then I say street, your mind still has to bring street up all the way from zero in order for it to get consciously activated. You're not ready at all to think about street. All right, are those predictions and implications clear? All right, so let's see if that's actually the case. Let's see if this is actually the way 
Never mind his work. So in this case, uh, for CogLab, the lexical decision CogLab, words and non-words uh, were presented. So you would see a word like doctor, you would see a non-word like blar, and uh, your task was to simply de uh, determine if the word was a real word. So that's your lexical decision. You are making a, de a determination if this word is part of the lexicon, is this part of our vocabulary. So you try to do that as quickly as possible. So you see something like speed, and you would say that's a non-word. You see something like manner, you say that's a word. And what the independent variable was is that these words, unknown to you, were presented in pairs. So they were presented one at a time, but they were paired in the experiment. And there was three conditions. They were either associated, two words that go together, they were either unassociated, two words that don't go together, or they were two non-words, right? Two words that definitely don't go together because uh, they were made up. So an example of an associated word pair, you would see doctor, you would be like, yep, that's a word. And your very next word was nurse. And those two words are associated. Doctors and nurses go together. Uh, you know, if I say doctor, you say nurse. That's just one of the things that uh, people think of when they think of doctor because they go uh, so much together. Unassociated words would be something like butter and thread, right? Nobody puts butter and thread together, right? Nobody says, oh, can you pick me up some butter? And they're like, oh, that reminds me, I got to get some thread for my clothes, right? Nobody makes that association. So those are two unassociated words. And then the sort of baseline condition, the sort of absolute baseline would be the two non-words, which are definitely because they're non-words, they're not in your semantic network, right? The fact that they're non-words means that they're not in that network at all. So we got speed and we got birth. So you say speed, not a word, birth, not a word. That's the third condition in this experiment. All right, so let's see what happened. Let's see if we get those faster reaction times to associated words and slower reaction times as we decrease the association. All right, so once again, we got reaction time over here. We got uh, milliseconds. Type of relationship, we got associated words, unassociated words, and two non-words. And uh, the first reaction time we're going to take a look at is for the non-words. So for you to decide that two words uh, were, uh, that a word was not a word after you read another non-word, that almost took you a full second. That was up to about 900 milliseconds. So that almost took you a full second to sit there and say, that's not a word. For associated, oh, sorry, for unassociated words, to determine that that second word was a word when the first word was not associated with that. So again, this is the only the time for the second word, right? This is only the reaction time for that second word. But that's about three quarters of a second. That's about 750 milliseconds. And then finally, for the associated words, we go down to about 730 milliseconds. So we are definitely faster when those two words are related. So we're gonna hone in here on this key result right here because this bar over here kind of decreases the visual impact of this. So let's zoom in a little bit on that and we can see the difference here. And as predicted by the model, <coughs> as predicted by this idea of spreading activation, when you had an associated word pair, that first word activated a node that node started spreading activation to any associated nodes. So this second associated word was already partially activated. And when you saw it and had to decide is it a word or not, it didn't take you very long to get it to full activation to make sure that, oh yes, nurse is actually a word. On the other hand, if they were unassociated, then the spreading activation did not reach the node for that second word because they were so far apart which means that when you saw that second word, you had to take it from zero all the way up to conscious activation, and that took that amount of time. So that spreading activation led to, it's about 15 milliseconds uh, of a difference. But again, this is, we're talking about your mind, we're talking about uh, evidence of this is the way that it's organized. And those 15 milliseconds, while they might not seem like much, although we're going to see those 15 milliseconds can be very important, um, those 15 milliseconds indicate that we are actually spreading our activation through our minds 
and this is through associated links between concepts, between ideas. All right, any questions on these results here? All right. So how does the Collins and Killian's, uh, sorry, Collins and Loftus' spreading activation model account for uh, the faster reaction times for associated words versus unassociated words? So we kind of just touched on that right now. But just to make sure that we all got it one last time, this decrease in reaction time, that reflects the fact that that second word was already activated. And the only way that it could have been activated was through that spreading association. So you saw a doctor, and even before you saw a nurse, that activation made you ready to see nurse. It was so close that it was just a little push, and you were like, oh, yeah, I'm conscious of nurse. On the other hand, this was the entire time that it took you to take out a concept from zero activation all the way to that top activation. So that spreading activation bought you this much time in terms of bringing that concept to a conscious level. All right, so importantly, and this is what we're going to spend uh, the rest of uh, today on. This model, uh, it's, it's very important. This is actually one of the more important kind of uh, knowledge implications that we've had so far. And it is so very easy to take a look at this and, number one, say, well, that's pairs of words. Big deal. So I'm faster at saying nurse after you say doctor. So I'm faster at saying uh, cat after you say dog. And you're not even that much faster, right? So we're not talking about, like, even half a second here. We're talking about, like, 15 to 20 milliseconds of time. So this is, as we're going to see, huge in your mind. 15 to 20 milliseconds is a massive amount of time in your mind. So it's important to appreciate what this does. And one of the best ways to do that is to tie it in to important implications in the real world. So that's what we're going to do right now. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on this before we kind of uh, get into some of the uh, um, examples of it. But what implications do you think that this model actually has for things like stereotypes, uh, concepts like racism, impact of sexism, basically for biases and how biases operate uh, in our society at large. So what does this spreading activation model have to say for how we uh, think about and uh, categorize other people? Mm -hmm. Like with races, like if you like associate like an African American with like dangerous, then anytime you see someone who is like if you already link that, if you see any African American on the street, you're like, oh, they're bad, and then mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. So one of the big important implications of this is that if you anything that you associate with a particular race, with a particular sex, um, those concepts get activated when you see that particular race or that particular sex. So if you associate dangerous with African Americans, you will activate that idea of dangerous and you will be more ready to think about danger when you see that particular individual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking in class about domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, and whenever we hear about like someone getting abused, like in an intimate partner violence situation, we always think that it could be like the man abusing his wife or whatever, you know, boyfriend abusing his girlfriend, but it's actually that women can also abuse men. We're learning about that and like how we're treating him like that. Yeah. Yes, that's a good point. Um, and that's another really important implication. I think the number last time I heard was like 40, 60 in terms of uh, who gets abused in a domestic relationship. And, uh, you know, if um, I'll, I'll give you two examples of how this actually impacts society at large. So um, I was reading about uh, shelters in the UK. Right? So remember this, 40% of domestic abuse uh, victims are male, 60% are female. And they have these, you know, they have shelters that a, a, an abused uh, individual can go to. And uh, they try to keep those uh, gender uh, specific. So they got shelters for females, they got shelters uh, for males. Um, there's about, I think the number was, uh, the ratio of shelters of females to males was 99 to 1. So for every 100 shelters, 99 of them were for females. One of them was for males. Even though 40% of, of uh, domestic abuse victims are males, 
and 60% are females. And the problem here is, again, this idea of spreading activation. Because the stories that you hear, the, um, the portrayal in the media, the portrayal in the movies, uh, you always see domestic abuse female, domestic abuse female. So when you hear about domestic abuse, you are ready to think about a female victim. Your mind is prepared. And because of that, it impacts the decisions that people make. It impacts that idea of, let's build another women's shelter. It impacts that idea of, oh, it must be a husband abusing their wife. Uh, when in fact, it's not the case. And this is, we've seen this very recently. Is anybody following the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp mess that's occurring? So uh, Amber Heard, uh, she, uh, a while back, accused Johnny Depp of um, uh, domestic abuse, of this exact incident. And uh, she was, she put out, you know, she wrote a, a opinion, an op-ed, and I think it was a Washington Post or something. And uh, there was backlash against Johnny Depp. People were very quick to believe her. She became like an ambassador of the U2 movement. Uh, she basically was immediately believed. Uh, Johnny Depp has now come out with uh, evidence that he was, in fact, the one that was being abused. And the amount of belief that Amber Heard, and I'm not taking sides here, but I'll point out biases we have in our society, the amount of belief that Amber Heard got, Amber Heard received for an opinion editorial in the Washington Post is more than Johnny Depp is getting with 16 witnesses, 87 security cameras, and basically a, a boatload of evidence. And the problem is, is because through our spreading activation models, when Amber Heard made her accusation, we were very ready to believe it because we have a strong association between domestic abuse and female victim. When Johnny Depp made that allegation, very, very much less people were quick to believe it. And they actually came out against him and, and were like, you know, this is him trying to twist the evidence, trying to twist 87 security cameras. So again, it's, it's a massive, this is a massively important idea that leads to implications about what it is that we need to do as a society to get beyond this. So those were the, those were the major points that I wanted to touch on. So we'll turn it from uh, sexism now to uh, the idea of racism. So one of the issues, one of the things that happens in our uh, society is that we are continually um, bombarded with media. We are continually bombarded with, with stimuli. And more than ever before, we are actually bombarded with um, manufactured stimuli. So unlike, you know, back in the ancient days where you would be like, well, what stimuli am I going to look at today? I'm going to watch snow falling out of my window. I'm going to go to the woods and see a bird, right? It was what nature decided. It was what the universe decided. That's what you were going to see. These days, however, we have manufactured stimuli, right? We have news reports and we have uh, blogs and we have TV shows and we got movies. We have a lot of manufactured things. And the issue that occurs is what is being associated in our media? And it's a very, very important question. So you take a look at uh, racist uh, biases. And we're talking, very important here to remember, we're talking racist bias, not racism per se. So it is incredibly important to remember that you can have a bias and not be a racist, but we got to get to the bias, right? So we're not talking about, we're not going to the point where we're talking about people that are, you know, wearing sheets and, and uh, you know, trying to do physical harm to anybody. We're talking about the everyday person who is being bombarded with images like this. So the more reports that you see, for example, in the news about, you know, Gary police search for shooter after finding guns, drugs uh, in the house, seeing this image here reinforces in your spreading activation network the idea of African-American male with guns, African-American male with drugs, African-American male with, uh, you know, shooter. So it reinforces that idea. And that's like you were saying, the next time you see an African-American male, you might not be racist and say, oh, I bet he's a drug dealer, right? You might not be racist and say, he's probably carrying a gun, but you are ready to think about guns. You are ready to think about drugs. And that happens because of 
reports like this. It also happens because of things like this. So I love Pulp Fiction, and I'm a huge fan of Samuel L. Jackson, but this is another association. So the more often you see African American with gun, even if he's the hero of the piece, right? Even if we'll go to a more clear example of the hero, Idris Elba in the, uh, the Dark Tower, for all five of you that saw this movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to launch the franchise. But anyways, hero of the piece, right? He was clearly the hero of the piece, not the anti-hero. He was the hero of the piece, but still reinforced that association, that link that we have between African-American male and guns got stronger every single time you saw the gunslinger pull his piece, that link got strengthened. So the spreading activation model, it strengthens these links as you kind of go through your world. Things that come together more often, like doctors and nurses, strengthen, strengthen, strengthen. Things that don't come together as often get weaker, weaker, and weaker. So again, the uh, one of the big kind of pushes that people are experiencing today is in uh, representation in the media. So representation in the media has become a very, very important issue. And part of that issue, which we're not gonna discuss, is the fairness of it, right? So there is a sort of like societally, ethically, it should be a fair distribution. We don't want uh, avenues closed off to different groups. That's just unfair. That's just not what our society says it's built upon. But what about psychologically? What, is, what do we have to say psychologically about this? Representation is very, very important psychologically because when there's not representation, certain associations become linked. So if you're not seeing African-American males as heroes in the movies, if you're not seeing African-American males as doctors in, the, you know, in TV shows, if all you're seeing are them with guns, and them in rap videos with you know just a bevy of females all around them, then when you see an African American male, you are not gonna think monogamous. You're not gonna think, you know, settled down, family man. This is what you're ready to think about. You know, so it's important to have those particular associations because these are the associations, unfortunately, that we are all walking around with. So again, it's not that you're a racist, but you have those associations ready to fire uh, in your mind. So once again, just to kind of tie this right in to the uh, spreading activation model, if you got an African American and you uh, African American male and you associate that with drugs because you've seen in movie after movie and TV show after TV show and news report after news report that those two links together you will have a strong association between those two nodes. If you see them always presented with guns, either again in the news or in the media, you will have a strong activation between those nodes. And then once again, if you see them with promiscuous behavior uh, in the media, you will have a strong activation between those nodes. And what do we do as a society when this is the case? Does anybody have any ideas? What can we do? Change our representation, you know? Change our representation. And how do we change our representations? In like the media and movies, maybe? In the media and movies. We need new associations. So the impact, whether or not you like them as a president or not, the impact that Barack Obama had on uh, the representation that we all have of African Americans was huge because every single time Obama was on the news, you associated African American with leader, you associated African American with well-spoken, you associated African American with calm, right? You associated him with all those aspects of Obama. People like Neil deGrasse Tyson, every single time you see a video where Neil deGrasse Tyson is talking about, oh my gosh, you know, the universe and it's expanding and it's so wonderful. You see African-American male scientists, African-American male highly educated, African-American male weird suits and ties, right? <laughs> you form those associations because again, the more they go together, 
the more uh, they become associated. That's one of the reasons why uh, this was uh, two years ago. I really wish the Power Rangers launched this franchise because this is actually probably one of the best examples of what I'm talking about here in terms of a different representation. So for those of you that saw the Power Rangers movie, uh, this was the Blue Ranger. He was actually on the spectrum and he was incredibly nonviolent. So he was getting bullied in school. He did not fight back. He was the one that was kind of, you know, uh, unable to defend himself. It was actually the Red Ranger that came in and saved him from a particular bullying situation. He was their science guy on the team, right? He's their tech guy on the team. And again, every single time he was on the screen, you got associations with African-American nonviolent, African-American scientist. And every time you see that, you cannot help but strengthen your associations for those particular, uh, whoop, where'd he go? Let's get him back. For those particular concepts. So we have highly strengthened associations for these particular concepts right now. The more we saw Barack Obama, the more this association got strengthened. The more we saw Neil deGrasse Tyson, the more this association got strengthened. And the more we saw that Blue Power Ranger, the more this association got strengthened. And again, this is, and very important to remember this, this is regardless of whether you believe it or not. This is regardless of whether you agree or not. When you see the two together, your mind cannot say, don't form that association. So just like your mind was unable to say, remember in the memory experiment, don't pay attention to the zero. Remember the zero made its way in when you had those nine digit list of numbers and the zero was the signal. Your mind couldn't keep the zero out. Your mind can't keep this out. The only way to fight so that this does not become the biased view that we have in our minds about uh, African-American males is to make sure that things like this are being represented. And the more they're represented, the stronger those activations will get. The less these are represented, the weaker these particular activations will get. And now if we have enough of this and we don't have as much of this, when somebody sees an African-American male walking towards them, they're going to sit there and they're going to be ready to think about maybe they're a leader. They're going to be ready to think about maybe they're highly educated. They're going to be ready to think about, oh, I bet you they're nonviolent. And they're not going to be as quick to activate these particular um, ideas right there. All right, so that is one of the big kind of implications. Uh, we are now going to, just again, because this is an important idea, we're going to expand on this and continue our look at it a little bit and just take it in a few more directions, a few more implications. So once again, just kind of we'll pick up on it right now. And again, this is, one of the best examples of why we do what we do. And remember, this, all of this, 15 milliseconds in a lab, right? 15 milliseconds in a lab is what told us that this spreading activation exists. And now we're taking a look at what it means. So we're actually gonna talk, we touched on it a little bit, the idea of toxic masculinity here as well. So let's go back into those implications. So once again, we're gonna talk about racism. We're gonna talk about uh, toxic masculinity kind of a hot topic right now. And again, it's those associations. It's just the, um, it's just the uh, presentation of that information. So just the associations of different concepts together, the more often it occurs, the stronger those links become. And then those links in your spreading activation network are what determine those other things that get activated. And it's important to realize, and this is just something that I don't want anybody to forget here, these are all of our activations. If you live in this country and you watch our media, you have this activation. So Barack Obama had those activations. And if you went to Barack Obama and you said, what are some of the stereotypes that are affecting African males today? He would very easily be able to tell you, well, you know, they think they're on drugs, they think they're you know, uh, uneducated, they think they're carrying guns. He knows these, 
If you know them, if you can name the stereotypes, you have these links. You have to. Because otherwise, if somebody said, oh, what are the stereotypes affecting African-American males? If you had no, none of these links, you'd be like, I don't know. I've, it's not linked to anything, right? So if you know the stereotypes, you got the links. So again, we need more of this. And this is what I was uh, talking about before. Nonviolent, master of operations. Not master of badassery. Not master of, you know, going to punch you in the face. Master of operations, right? He was their scientist. He was the guy with all the electronics equipment. He was the guy when the, uh, when the bully started uh, breaking his pencils in detention. He was the guy that just kind of sat there confused going, I don't know what to do here. And every single time you saw that, your association between African Americans and violence got a little less strong, a little less strong. Because your mind was saying, wait, those two don't go together. Let me weaken that link a bit. I don't need it as much. So again, we're talking about the need to weaken these links by forming new links. And really, that is one of the only ways that these biases are going to get uh, thrown out, that these biases are going to be overcome. So you can, you can go to sensitivity training. Uh, you can do what Starbucks did after they called the cops on uh, two African-American males that were sitting there in their coffee shop. Uh, and they had to close down all the Starbucks for half a day for sensitivity training. You can do sensitivity training. It's not going to do anything for this, right? Those workers at that Starbucks, they were ready to think about this when they saw those African-Americans in their shop. They didn't have these activated enough. And you can tell them all you want. This is, you know, this isn't the case. You got to think about, you know, other people's points of view, whatever, whatever. But unless you weaken these links and you can't do it consciously, just like you can't get rid of that zero, and unless you strengthen these links, it's just not going to work. So they did put in a hard and fast rule. They did have something like, we let anybody sit here. But again, people in that coffee shop, when they see an African-American male, they're going to say, we don't, you know, we let people sit here, but I'm worried. Something about this situation is still making me worry until we change this into this. And then why would you worry if Neil deGrasse Tyson was in your Starbucks, right? Why would you sit there and go, I, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to do something violent. I think he's going to like rob us or maybe he has a gun. You never think that, right? Because it's just not that association. All right. So other associations. And this is, again, something that is important and it's just the way that we think. And the biases that we have, the reason they're called biases is because they're not true, right? The reason they're called biases is because they are not the actual truth of the matter. And in, in reality, the more the experiences that we have are not in line with the truth of the matter, the more biases we're going to have. And that is for any concept. So just to kind of give you an example of this one, uh, we do have biases against Caucasians as well. So we have biases for Caucasians. For example, uh, Caucasians are oftentimes associated with uh, affluence. And this is, again, because of the way that they're portrayed in the media. Anytime a billionaire gets interviewed, you are 99% likely to see a white male, right? So you're either talking to Bezos or you're talking to uh, Bill Gates or you're talking to some other uh, white individual. So that gets associated. And as much as you can say, well, you know, uh, white individuals, Caucasians, they're struggling. They're a lot of them below the poverty line. Your mind immediately goes to uh, affluent. Your mind immediately goes to uh, ideas of uh, socioeconomic status. Your mind immediately goes to and you're ready to think about things like uh, intelligence as well. Uh, things like uh, privilege as well. So if, has anybody seen this debacle? Is anybody aware of? Yeah. Notice who's here, right? Notice that, that uh, lineup of individuals, right? Caucasian, 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 privilege. Those two just got massively associated. 
And that's why when you look online, you will actually see people, um, you know, proud of their degrees. You'll actually see people post online, post on Facebook. Oh my gosh, I'm so, you know, thankful. I finally graduated with my degree. And you'll see people blaming it all on privilege. And the reason is because that's has become a very strong association because once again, you see this almost all the time. So that kind of leads to this idea of, you know, a certain bias that you would have towards Caucasians as well. And this bias, again, is coded in your spreading activation network. So there are some massive, we've already talked about some implications, uh, but I'll just uh, put up some other ones. So there are massive implications in the fact that this is the spreading activation links for a Caucasian male. And this is the spreading activation links for a African American male. And one of the places that this has been seen very concretely, very importantly, and one of the places where 15 milliseconds can make a big difference is in police enforcement. So if a person is in police enforcement and they pull over somebody for a traffic violation and that person reaches in to their pocket and starts pulling out an ambiguous object, they do not have a lot of time to determine is that ambiguous object dangerous? Is that a gun? Or is that ambiguous object, you know, a wallet? So am I in danger for my life or am I not in danger for my life? They have very little time to make that decision. So what do you think is gonna happen if the person that they're looking at, if the person that they pulled over is a Caucasian male, what is that likely to be interpreted as? It's likely to be interpreted as a wallet because what's being activated here, as soon as they see that Caucasian male, they're ready to think about money. Money is halfway activated. So if they see an ambiguous object, that might be money, money is up there, and they're like, oh, I recognize that, that's a wallet. On the other hand, if it's an African-American male, they are ready to think gun. They just are. And it doesn't matter if it's the nicest police officer, the least racist police officer. It doesn't matter if it's police officer Barack Obama. It doesn't matter if he's the new guy on the, you know, on the block. This association is still there. And when you take a look at the fact that officers are ready to think about gun when they see an ambiguous object, all of a sudden those 15 milliseconds become incredibly important. And the ability to recognize gun or wallet, depending upon what got activated, becomes massively important. And one of the things that I think is unappreciated by a lot of uh, organizations that are trying to combat this is that this is not a conscious decision, right? You have never in your lifetime sat down at a desk and thought to yourself, doctor and nurse, they have to go together. Let me really study that. Let me really think about it. I have got to link doctor and nurse. You have just gone through your life experiencing things and you've experienced doctor and nurse, doctor and nurse over and over and over again. You have watched media and you have experienced this over and over again. You have watched media and you've experienced that over and over again. So has everybody else. So we're not talking about racists here because one of the sort of immediate conclusions that came out of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement was that because of this increase in deaths uh, of African-American males uh, from cops, it has to be that these cops are racist. It has to be that we have some sort of racist subgroup of cops that are going around murdering individuals. And the data, there's actually studies on this, do not bear that out. There is no uh, large group of racist uh, cops out there. There's no secret infiltration. It's the fact that this individual comes with certain associations that basically help to interpret very quickly ambiguous stimuli as safe. This individual does not. And again, those biases are gonna be shared with everyone. Everybody has those biases. Barack Obama has those biases. And if I put him in a experiment and measure his reaction times to words, 
He would be faster on black and gun than he would be on white and gun. It's just because of the society that we live in. All right. And that's a prediction. That's for YouTube. All of this is prediction, by the way. All right. <laughs> so, so how do we combat this? Uh, we got to experience new associations. It's the only way to do this. We got to stop experiencing the old associations. We got to start experiencing new associations. We got to make new links between uh, uh, different uh, concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a question. So, like, it's kind of predicting that um, when new associations will put on, like, new stereotypes and stuff, is there kind of, like, anything that says that, like, new associations, like, people might lash back at them and say, like, wait, those two things don't really match up. Like, um, like, like if you were to put, like, uh, like an African-American in a superhero movie, like, let's say, like, a Black Panther or something, like, if people were to mm -hmm. fight back against that and say, like, this doesn't like go with what I like, what I've experienced and what I believe. Mm -hmm. um, consciously, yeah, and we we've seen that uh, all the time. And um, it's it's funny that you that you mentioned comic book movies because casting for comic book movies is a huge issue, and um, oftentimes it, it tends to go racial. And this is just this is just. Uh, uh, an issue that I have with that reporting. Oftentimes it tends to go racial because people are so primed to think along racist terms these days. But people have to remember that Chris Evans was firmly rejected as Captain America. And they wanted another actor, I forget what his name is, but he was on a TV show called Human Target. And he is your typical blonde, square jawed. He looks like Captain America. And fans were adamant that he was going to be Captain America. And they rejected him because he doesn't look that way. So they rejected the fact that he didn't fit those associations. However, you can consciously reject it all you want. As long as you see it and experience it, you're still making those associations. So I could sit here and convince myself after a long time, doctors and nurses don't go together. There's no reason if you have a doctor, you're going to have to have a nurse. I could convince myself. And in five years, maybe I'd believe it but I'd still have those connections. So it doesn't matter if you consciously reject it. Uh, it doesn't matter for all those people that are not going to see Captain Marvel because they don't want to see a powerful woman. Every single time you see that trailer, that association gets stronger. So that's one of the reasons why media is so important. So it works the other way too. You can say to yourself, I'm not racist. I, you know, I try not to be racist. I do my best. But you see that news report, and you see the you see the gun, you see the African American suspect. That link has just gotten stronger, you know, and that's why uh, a lot of watch groups talk about misrepresentation in the media, right? That's why they're like, well, why are so many of the news reports, you know, about African Americans when they only do this much of the crime, and you know, it's because it's important. So you got to experience new associations. You got to make those new connections. And you have to not experience the stereotype associations, and that will weaken the old connections. So again, we need those new connections. So as much as it's important to have representation in Hollywood, this connection here did not need to be strengthened. So psychologically, this is not an ethical or social issue here, but this was not good in terms of weakening the African Americans Carrying Guns Association. Uh, this was amazing in uh, weakening that African Americans carry guns association. And again, that's what we need. We need those new connections. We need to make those new connections and strengthen those new connections. And just to show you that this is not hypothetical, I found a research paper on this uh, where it's uh, from the Journal of Ethnic and Racial Studies, Christian Nationalism and White Racial Boundaries Examining White's Opposition to Interracial Marriage. So this is an entire study on what were the determinants for, a, um, uh, for Christian parents. If they asked, how willing would you be for your daughter to marry outside of, uh, outside of your race? So that's what this entire study was about. And the key thing to, uh, that I wanted to point out um, was this finding right down here, which was no close black friends. So if you had, so this, this whole uh, graph is a little bit complicated, but it measures uh, how much resistance are you going to have? How much opposition would you have to your daughter marrying? In this case, this is an African-American. 
And if you had no close back black friends, you were more opposed. This is the positive um, effect of it. You were more opposed to her, your daughter, potentially uh, marrying a black individual, which means that if you do have close black friends, you would be less opposed. Now, why would close black friends make any difference? Yep. Strengthens the connection. Strengthens the connection. Yeah. Exactly. So when you have a close black friend, that literally means you're going to be spending time with them. Every single time you spend time with them, anything that happens, that connection gets strengthened. So for individuals with close black friends, that black friend, if they helped you move, helpful, got strengthened. That black friend, if they you know, invite you to a barbecue, good host, got strengthened. And all of those kind of, you know, caring, warm, uh, reliable, all of those things that makes a good friend, all of those got strengthened. And why would you not want your daughter to marry somebody like that? So you can see concretely the effect of having those new experiences from just one close, you know, black friend, experience those new experiences, your activations get changed. And then when you think about, you know, when you picture it in your mind, and as a parent, I know exactly how this feels, when you picture that boyfriend in your mind, all of those associations that start to get activated influence your decision. And if it's kind, helpful, loyal, there when I needed them, of course you're going to be like, yeah, my daughter would be great if my daughter married somebody like that. If, on the other hand, you don't have a close black friend, you're simply relying on the media, and you think guns, drugs, a bevy of other women, why would you want that for your daughter? So you can see new exposures, new, uh, uh, new experiences, make new connections, and those have tangible uh, results. All right, and the last thing I'll, I'll touch on, because again, this is a very important topic as well, very timely as well. So the idea of toxic masculinity has been a hot topic, a hot button topic recently, and um, the uh, uh, one of the issues with it is that uh, one of the concepts it doesn't get talked a lot uh, about in, in uh, toxic masculinity has to do with gender norms in our society about males. That's what toxic masculinity is all about. The idea is that some of those gender norms are just not good. And one that oftentimes does not get mentioned is the idea that somehow males are in control of the world. So we have this idea that somehow at some level, males are in control of the world. And that in itself is just not the case. So we're, we're not going to have time to delve into this too much. I put the link for the Gillette commercial that called out toxic masculinity. That was one of the big ones that occurred. And this bias that males are in control, that idea that has permeated our society and is actually contributing to the toxic part of masculinity, that was on full display. And this is to, just to show you the power of biases on full display in a commercial that was calling out toxic masculinity, right? They fell for one of the aspects of toxic, toxic masculinity because if you look at that commercial, every single issue is uh, because of males. They're the cause of every single issue. So when you saw the boys acting out, there was an entire row of males sitting there. Does anybody remember what they said? Boys will be boys. This was the part where two uh, children were fighting, two male children were fighting, and all the males are sitting there going, boys will be boys. What are we going to do? Boys will be boys. This was the experience in the media because of this particular bias. I have heard people say boys will be boys. 90% of them were women. women. Yeah. I have seen <laughs> boys out of control and for parents – in the room, you'll know this feeling when you see somebody else's children out of control and you know it's not your place to discipline them, right? You know it's not your place to step in, but you look at the parent like, when are you going to, you know, when are you going to maybe call this? And it's usually, you do it, and it's usually the mother that's there, and uh, it's usually if they don't get involved, that's what they say, boys will be boys. And yet somehow 
Gillette, who again was trying to call it out, fell for the old, uh, for the bias that his boys will be boys. And who must have caused this? Well, it's got to be males, right? It's got to be that part of society. So one of the issues in, in this whole idea of toxic masculinity, I am completely on board with toxic masculinity. I did not suffer through years of depression without asking for help because of healthy masculinity, right? So, I mean, it personally affected me, but it's, it's a bias that has permeated it. And when you take a look at toxic masculinity, when you read the articles, when you do the research on it, just pay attention, look for that bias and see how often men are blamed for that aspect of our society because of this particular bias here. And I'll just end this with one last example. So this was one that I did have to call out. It was an article about a university that started a, uh, a group, started a workshop to help individuals to understand toxic masculinity. And I scanned it, I knew it was coming. So I scanned the article, actually no, I read it, but I found it and it goes, As a, at a discussion group meeting last month, which included men and non-binary people, which is a nice way of saying no women were there, right? That's the only group that's missing out of this. And again, you just have that bias where it's just a little connection. And if you're walking by a poster for a workshop on toxic masculinity, and you're sitting there and you say, oh, toxic masculinity, and it links to males in control, and you're a female, why would you go? But the matter of the fact is that these are gender norms that are made by society. So if we really wanna deal with this, we gotta get rid of this idea. This is actually part of the toxic idea. And you can see how tricky these biases are because even Gillette, who was trying to call them out, even this university that was trying their best to address the issue, they're still missing that mark because of those biases. All right, so that was a full class. Uh, so that's it for today. Next time when we meet, we're gonna do connectionist networks. You'll find out why self-driving cars are actually working now. But uh, other than that, I will see you uh, next time.